so here at Interop, uh, it, it's simply going to be an exciting week because we're officially launching the, uh, the native 8211AC platform for Cisco. And Mark, you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, so we're really excited. Uh, we're going to have our new brand new 3700 uh, at the booth 409 at the show. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have one we could bring here to show you physically touch, but you can see it up here um, on, the, on the slide itself. So a brand new high end of the family portfolio, best in class for both enterprise and service provider and as Walt was mentioning that uh, the big the big change one of the big changes here is that we're integrating on AC so now we'll have the module that's already been shipping for about three and a half months the 3600 We've got the 3700 that comes in at the top end of the portfolio with the integrated uh, 11 AC on the 5 gigahertz radio so it's the same dual band dual radio type approach uh, also carries forward the modularity that was introduced with the 3600. Uh, a few other changes and modifications, but it comes in, maintains the 4x4 approach with the RF design that uh, is still the only AP in the market doing that today, and uh, integrate 11AC. So lots of excitement, and now we're going to be offering uh, both solutions, so like I said, modularity or integrated play for the customers and enterprise and providers. Um, and I emphasize the providers because we've seen a lot of interest out of the service providers early on, which was very actually quite surprising uh, with the module. Um, we thought we would definitely get interest, but we had a large number of beta sites, and our first actual production deployment with 11AC was a provider in the Asia Pacific area. So that was uh, that was really surprising. So we've seen a lot of uh, really good interest on that area. So here we're just showing that the module, the, a module that will be supported day one, will be our security and spectrum monitor uh, monitoring. Uh, uh, module that's been out since about January of this year, and then going forward, we will have additional modules that we can uh, that we can plug in as well and talk to. Uh, and then, with the culmination of, uh, we do plan on a Wave Two module, and that's something that we did announce prior to last um, the last M Plus I in Las Vegas uh, in about April time frame, where we did make a reference that we would be bringing. Uh, to market a Wave 2 module for both 36 as well as the 3700 uh, when those chipsets and products are all uh, available. So yeah, so really excited on that part. So we, we bring forward a lot of the, uh, the technology that's been available and we enhance, so we've reworked our clean air technology. It's still hardware based, integrated with the individual radio, just like it has been. And uh, we've reworked it to be able to support a full 80 megahertz wide uh, channel spectrum that comes with 11AC Wave 1. Uh, same set of uh, hardware based signatures, if you will, uh, RF patterns and wireless patterns that we're detecting and looking for uh, on 24 as well as 5. Uh, so that brings that, that sprout forward. Uh, client link technology, so it's an interesting uh, enhancement here. What we've done with the 3.0 is we, with 2.0, we added 11N to the client link implicit beam forming down from the AP to the clients. So the clients don't need to have any beam forming technology. It's a down uh, one way from the AP to the client. Uh, irrespective of the client itself. They don't have to have the 11N option. So what we've done with 3.0 is we've added that same support for 11AC clients. So now that will automatically just enhance the performance downstream from on a client by client basis on a packet by packet basis to the actual clients themselves. Now, in addition to that, we also support the explicit compressed beam forming option. Um, it's still an option with 11AC. However, the large majority of the clients that are available today with 11 ac do actually implement support for compressed beam forming, which wasn't the case with 11N. In fact, to date, um, I'm only aware of one client that uh, implemented compressed beam forming for 11N, and I think it's a gaming. Yeah, it well, it's because possible. it's totally optional. Yeah, I know, and it's still an option, actually, 11 ac which was, because at one point it was tracking to be a part of the yeah. built-in, and then they opted at the last minute to make a, a standard. But the reality is, you know, with the whole focus and the evolution of wireless as an access layer technology, uh, the performance enhancements and the uh, potential for both the performance but also quality of signal yeah. uh, improvement, uh, you know, it just became a fact on the chipset side for the client. So that, so that was good to see. And you'll be able to actually use client link and uh, ECBF uh, concurrently. So they'll operate together. There's no uh, one or the other type of approach on that part. It, it, it's, it's definitely an additive benefit. So with AC, what we're seeing is more clients are participating for uh, explicit beam forming, and then the client beam forming that's from Cisco, the, the implicit, the implicit plus the explicit, you get an additive benefit on top of that. Um, when we had uh, when we have client link for the 11N APs, because the 11N clients were optionally participating, most of the 11N clients were participating with client link 2.0. 
we show 60% higher throughput, um, you know, wider range with client link enabled. Uh, we still have, we're still waiting for the results with client link 3.0 plus explicit beam forming, but we suspect it's going to have that added benefit. So 60% as baseline. Yeah, you know, the other thing that's really interesting too is it's not just about speeds and feeds because we've definitely seen a quality improvement on the signal as well at range. So they kind of go together uh, in, in a way, obviously, but in the sense of what a client can maintain at greater distance from the AP. Yeah. But that's definitely, uh, you know, that's the big thing and then what comes with it is better performance. And, and, but that's my fear with, even with Wave 1 gear, is that the airspace is going to get so noisy that it's going to be so difficult to get high throughput transmissions. You know, it's, it's the same problem you got with a cell phone. You get too far away from a tower, everything just kind of goes to hell in a handbasket. And then when Wave 2 ramps everything up through the roof, then what's going to happen? So I certainly hope that your enhancements are going to be enough to make things tolerable. Yeah, it, it, it's so with AC baseline, you have higher modulation, higher efficiency. Right. By definition, meaning, meaning the RF spectrum is better utilized. Um, and then this actually is a good segue to our second point. So with with um, with the 3700, we're not just introducing uh, bigger and better speeds with uh, a four by four. Myro 11 AC platform, but we're also introducing this notion of high density experience. And so, let me just go over the problem statement here. The problem statement for high high density is what we're seeing with a lot of uh, enterprises today, whether it's K through 12, higher education, um, but also healthcare and, and enterprises in general, where you have this uh, phenomenon of more and more clients coming onto the coming onto the workspace. Not only are they coming on to the workspace, but you're also bringing in more clients, right? This might be OLD, 2.0, 3.0, whatever you want to call it, having more and more clients tethered to those users. I walk around with three devices now, now I just bought uh, a Nexus 7 tab, so now I have four devices. That is just growing. And then on top of that, on each of those devices, I'm servicing more and more rich media. I'm accessing uh, the cloud for my uh, streaming video, for my um, um, you know, CAD drawings, whatever, if, I, if I'm uh, in, in manufacturing. So all of these drive high usage and high client density. So higher bandwidth, high client density networks, and that's where this Cisco high density experience technology becomes important. And in a nutshell, high density experience technology is a suite of solutions, and um, th this suite of solutions include clean air 80 megahertz. So we looked, we, we took clean air and made it go across 80 megahertz. We effectively had to re-engineer clean air uh, to have it spread across 80 megahertz for 11 AC, uh, and also still uphold that accuracy when in terms of uh, detecting granular sources of interference. Um, client link 3.0, being able to detect not just AG clients, and clients, but also AC clients now. Uh, and then also RF turbo performance, meaning to, to be able to scale up to 60 plus clients, each client servicing multimedia traffic and not showing any degradation in, in throughput as you scale up. What are you guys worried about finding in 5 gigahertz with clean air? I know in 2.4 is a disaster with <laughs> things like Bluetooth and wireless microphones like the one you're wearing, but 5 gigahertz, with the possible exception of some really old radars, should be fairly clean. For DFS, for, for anything that's non-Wi-Fi, so so more and more uh, for now, yeah. So, for now. so there are more and more Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi devices that are getting to five gig, and it's just inevitable that uh, over time five gig is going to be uh, contested, or there are going to be more devices operating in five gig almost exclusively, and with AC. Because we're increasing the bandwidth from you know 40 to 80 megahertz, we effectively are also uh, using more real estate. Yeah. Right? So you went from let's say 2021 20, channels to now uh, uh, to 11 and now to five non-overlapping channels for AC. Mm -hmm. So 
And, and, and then with wave two, yeah, that just becomes it's ranked 160 me megahertz wide channels. You're basically down to two. <laughs> exactly. So less real estate, meaning you have to be more intelligent about your spectrum um, and, and be able to detect those uh, sources of interference and, and be, be able to mitigate them automatically. That becomes important. In the previous slide, you guys mentioned that you're future proofing this AP and the 3600 as well. I'm assuming that's for whenever your wave two stuff comes out. That's right. Okay. Will the 3600 be able to drive wave two equipment? Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think a couple of different caveats that we're working with all the chipset vendors to really define you know what the scope as well as right. the WFA, what the scope of wave two could and should be. Um, but, and I, I could see some variance between a module and an AP, but that's something that's still being worked on as far as integrated wave two. I mean, the key for us is multi-user MIMO, but yeah, absolutely, we have no qualms about the 3600 being able to handle You guys are gonna target doing that with AT power? Um, it would, at that point today, with a module and a 3600, you're up to 18 watts with the, yeah. so you need AT or ESP. So you think there's enough over? You think there's enough overhead with that and you won't have to do like a dual AF power no, scheme, right? No, no, okay. not at all. There'll be, there'll be a sufficient room for uh, for AT given the 25.5 watts that you're going to be able to drive it on the client side, the AT side. Okay. That, that's more than sufficient for that. Um, what I think, to your point earlier with the 160, that's a whole discussion on itself. In itself <laughs> that, you know, we do expect a, a series of Wave 2 products to absolutely have 160 support, and that's kind of a dance that we're doing with both with the chipset vendors and our engineering teams right now, but also talking with customers and client side vendors to really understand, you know, where they sit on the whole story. For instance, we know that the client chipsets will have 160, both 80 plus 80 and 160 from the, from the let's say, the chipset vendor that has the majority of clients today. That's the plan. Now, whether that gets turned on or not, it's a whole different discussion. And, and even if it was turned on, is it configured and made use of is a whole other second part of that discussion. So, uh, at a minimum, from a Wave 2 perspective, I could see for sure it's multi user MIMO is the big one. Yeah. Potentially an extra spatial screen, and that really comes down to whether it's a single user or a multi user spatial screen. Yeah. And then a minimum 80 megahertz wide. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, in that part. So, a, potentially a little bit of extra bandwidth, and then the number of concurrent users you can support in the product. So, so those are really the big ticket items, and then... PowerDraw for sure is going to exceed AF if you want the full benefit of the SC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, the, so what we're going to do is basically, if you want to fit it in an AF footprint, you'll be able to ratchet down um, the, the, the AP, maybe uh, lower power MCS rates, for example, as a way to fit under AF. Uh, the good thing is 90% of the switches shipping now, or 90% of the access switches uh, sold by Cisco are AT ready. Okay. Um, and certainly the, the current generation 3750, and of course the 3850 Catalyst um, all support um, AT PMN Plus. Thank you. I mean, actually on that point too, I think the one interesting thing is what we built in the, thir the, the 3700. Um, one of the big focus areas was all about flexibility and, and scale and performance. And flexibility in the sense of things like if you do connect it to an AF port, it'll automatically down rev itself from a 4x4.3 four four to 3x3.3 three 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 on both radios, so 2.4 and, and 5. So you still get great performance. It'll issue a trap message to the effect that it, wasn't, it didn't have sufficient power, and you can take corrective action after the fact. But, uh, and then obviously, once it's at full speed, you, you, you're back up to 4x4.3 four four on both radios. So, so it's pushing best-in-class performance and, and going back to the high-density experience. It's really addressing what we see as uh, you know, a, a huge pain point today in the enterprise and also with carriers. It's just high client density. So clean air, 80 megahertz, client 3.0, uh, RF turbo performance, and then also uh, smart room, which is the ability for clients to roam uh, intelligently uh, between APs, fast roaming, so that uh, you know the, the client back address is cached on the neighboring AP, so that you know, you're talking about uh, milliseconds of, of roaming speeds. Uh, that becomes important. Better handoff between unlicensed and, and licensed uh, cells, for example. That's what we mean by smart room, and that's part of the HD experience technology. And then finally, uh, RF noise reduction, which is something we're, we'll, we'll introduce after FCS sometime next calendar year. This is the ability for the APs to uh, 
uh, to, to recognize uh, the, the neighboring APs better and to basically reutilize or, or recycle the spectrum better so that potentially you could have the same channels even with the adjacent APs. So today, best practice for 2.4, for example, you have alternating um, non-overlapping channels 1, 6, 1, 6, and 11, for example, with neighboring APs. In, in certain high client density deployments, you may even have to deploy the APs in a high, high density uh, fashion. And uh, because of that, you may need to recycle that uh, channel as well. So with RF noise reduction, potentially you could have neighboring APs using the same channel, channel one or channel six, for example, uh, as an extreme case. And that's just better utilizing the spectrum and, and um, um, yeah. The better usage of the, of the spectrum. Right. And stuff that we baked into the dashboard architecture of the 3700 itself. Um, the other part, I think, on the RF Turbo, which is also worth calling out, is that you know 11AC certainly about speeds and feeds, more light, more streamlined, if, if more efficient is one of the conversations you hear about from a protocol perspective. High density and 11AC often get brought together in the same discussion. And while Wave 2 is really the big, probably the multi-users, the big high density play there, there's no doubt that the other areas you can't, you, you have to keep working at all your other aspects of your product. And it's just, you know, scale of the radio on a concurrent device perspective, uh, working your device driver level. You know, we made a big statement last year with the 3600 um, going back almost two years now, actually, uh, where we came out with a very high level of number of concurrent video clients that we can sustain with quality on 3600. And, and what we're saying here is we're taking that up another notch, and we continue to work on our software to make it continue to improve and enhance it on that part. And with a high rate of throughput as well. To that scalability, we just had two lines across the room here. Um, there's 60 plus clients on full speed multimedia traffic, right? Give us some uh, examples on how does that scale. If you go to 100 people in the same room, that was a question. Or if it's other less used protocols, um, I mean, it doesn't. Even RDP is not high density right. multimedia, right? So how do you scale to 150, 200, and 300 people in the same room? So that's kind of stuff we'll be coming out with as we're doing your testing on it right now mm -hmm. uh, to look and show basically showcase the improvements in that throughput. Well, you can use well, the scale on that part. Yeah. Sure. Well, what we're going to be confident is in showcasing is yeah. that at least 60 clients, each client running, let's say, high definition video. Uh, you know, 30 frames per second or more, uh, let's say two to five megabits per second per client, and showing the ramp up from one to 60 without any degradation on a per client basis. That's something we'll, we'll show uh, in a mirror car report um, in, in, in competitive testing as well. Yeah, how, how does it go when you put 120 people in the same room? Is it just two APs is going to do the same thing? How is that? So, so for so for each AP, it can service uh, 200 clients per radio. So, uh, technically, you can go up to 400 clients per AP. Um, but for best practices, well, obviously, we don't recommend that sort of you know, design. Um, when you go beyond, let's say. 60 or these these uh, prescribed threshold, you will start seeing some degradation. Right, maybe the video if starts chopping. You have a second AP. Will it automatically shift traffic over to it? Yes. Then then you have the ability to to load balance. You can you can set our profiles. You can have um, RSSI RSSI characteristics to to define our profiles or how you want to associate those clients to which APs. And that, that way you can better load balance between two APs. So absolutely you can, you can do that. It don't happen without any other third party device. So that's, that's, that's correct. Just but you need goes to, there and it goes automatically shoots me to the other one. Yeah, but to your, to your question earlier about, you know, Jagdish and CMX, you need a Cisco AP, right? This, no, no, <laughs> this, no, no, is, this is the benefit of end-to-end -end Cisco solution is that you have best-in-class RF here, and then on top of that, you have, let's say, value-added services such as CMX sitting on top of that best-in-class RF.